Welcome to the Connecting with Coincidence radio show with Dr. Bernie Beitman, MD, bringing together the world's synchronicity experts to help you use meaningful coincidences to develop spiritually, psychologically, and practically. For more information, put Connecting with Coincidence into your web browser to find the book, website, Psychology Today blog, YouTube channel, and Facebook page. And now, here is the host of the Connecting with Coincidence radio show, Dr. Bernie Beitman, MD. Yes, uh, welcome to Connecting with Coincidences. I am your host, Dr. Bernie Beitman, MD. I'm a psychiatrist in private practice and on the faculty at the University of Virginia. Carl Jung led the development of synchronicity theory. I am leading the practical application of these meaningful coincidences. Weird coincidences are messages to us earthlings about the true nature of reality, messages we can try to, to decode. They tell us that our minds are interconnected and are part of a greater mind that I call the psychosphere, that each of us has hidden powers and abilities. Look for their helpful advice at their evidence for deep connections with those you love. To learn more, put co Connecting with Coincidence in your web browser to read my Psychology Today blog and my book, Connecting with Coincidence. To see how sensitive you are to coincidences, go to my website to take the Weird Coincidence Survey. Connect with Coincidence, synchronicity spoken here. Our guest today is Frank Joseph. Frank is the published author of 35 books, including Synchronicity and You and Synchronicity as a Mystical Experience, which came out this year. He has been the editor-in-chief of Ancient American Magazine since its debut in 1993, is the author of 20 books about prehistory, republished in as many languages, including the Atlantis Encyclopedia, Opening the Ark of the Covenant, and Unearthing Ancient America. Joseph is a frequent guest speaker at the various metaphysical and archaeological societies in the United States and abroad. Welcome to the show, Frank. Thank you very much, Dr. B. It's a real pleasure to be here. Thank you. In your book, get right to one of the more interesting coincidences. You mention a, a cloud shaped in the form of a delta and its meaning to you. Uh, would you uh, please tell us about that and, and ha the context of it and how you interpreted it? Uh, that was uh, probably the single most uh, powerful, meaningful coincidence of my life. And like you, I'm trying to make sense of these things and been documenting them uh, for going on 30 years now. And uh, at that time of this, this cloud formation, my wife and I were visiting Estes Park, Colorado. And um, during that time, I was interested in this question of, is there really uh, a conscious, creative force that individual human beings can have some kind of a personal relationship with? Is that really possible? I, I tended to believe that it's pretty obvious that there is some kind of an organizational conscious principle at work throughout the universe, but uh, it's so vast. How is it, is it really possible that there is some kind of a personal relationship possible? So that was on my mind, and I was interested in studying that. And um, so we're at Estes Park, and um, I had this um, intense dream uh, it was one of those dreams that's different from other dreams. We've all had this type. It wasn't one of the silly things you have a hard time remembering. This was so real that when you woke up off of it, you thought f for a few moments that it, it must have been a, a real experience, and your your mind has trouble adjusting for a few seconds to uh, uh, trying to file this thing in your own uh, understanding of the world. The dream was very simple um, and uh, not particularly long although very vibrant. And the dream was that I was staring eyeball to eyeball with a Native American. And um, he was very dark, had very black eyes, black hair, sharp features, long hair, just exactly as you might imagine. And he's staring at me very intently, and he's speaking in a language I do not understand. And uh, his eyes are very hypnotic, but I don't know what he's saying. And somehow I know, I realize that there is a 
I was going to say a man, but a male figure, put it that way, a male figure, off to my right. I do not see this male figure, but I know that he is standing there or hovering there. I don't know what, but he's there. So this Indian is, and the Indian, by the way, has a, um, I recall also, a tall white feather coming out of the back of his hair. It's very easy to remember because the hair was just jet black. And uh, so as, as he's speaking to me, addressing me very earnestly, I tell the male figure without looking away, says, I don't know what this man is telling me. And the, the male voice comes in. He says, uh, tomorrow you will see God. It's the moment that he said that, the dream ended. And it was uh, totally unlooked for. I'm not going around dreaming or wondering about what Americans are, ancient Americans are going to tell me or anything like that. We were there to enjoy the, the beauty of Estes Park, not to really even think about anything, just to imbibe all the nice vibes there. And so uh, I told my wife about it. You know, she said, well, that's pretty powerful. Put that in your synchronicity, you know. Said, well, sure, you know. But I more or less forgot about it during the day. I was just looking at uh, the interesting beauty there that was uh, involving us. And so we were just enjoying the park and walking along that afternoon when uh, we were walking through a valley that was Oh, just spectacular, beautiful, it was unbelievable. And a cloud formed uh, that was kind of caught our attention. It was a perfect, a, a perfect triangle. It was a strange thing. It formed. I mean, I never saw anything quite like that before. It was a perfect triangle. As a cloud formed into a triangle, uh, it became more and more perfect. And this was not an illusion. This was something everybody could see. It seems to me yeah. very, very difficult to imagine a cloud being in a triangular shape, particularly exactly. a perfect one. This was a great delta, and so we were both stopped and, and looking. And as the cloud formed into this shape for a long moment, I mean several minutes, there was no other cloud in the sky, by the way. That's <laughs> a perfectly yeah, I... Colorado mountain sky, pristine blue, and there's just one single cloud. And on one end... Uh, one uh, uh, rested it rested on one end on one peak, and its other end rested on another peak. So there were maybe for five minutes, there's this gigantic white triangle in the sky resting perfectly on with its apex with its bottom apexes on on either peaks. And it was like, and so my wife Laura she says, "There's there's your God." And, of course, we knew, since we've been studying these things, that the number three and triangles are archetypes around the world for God, from the Great Pyramid to the Christian Trinity. As you're aware of that, three is the, the, the God numeral. And it was like, it was astounding. Well, that didn't end there. Um, although, of course, I immediately connected with my with my uh, synchronicity dream the night, the, the night before, the morning before. So then I, I, I was really quite astounded by this, and slowly the, the triangle just um, broke up and vanished. You know, so later in the later in the day, did it um, vanish? Did it vanish while you were looking at it? Yeah. Yeah. So it was a temporary. Well, it, began, it, began to, it began to collapse while I was looking oh. at it. It just went as the cloud went. You know. And so it was it was almost for you just for you to see. Well. I, I couldn't even I couldn't even accept anything like that. That was just something that that was unacceptable. Uh, because so then, um, well, why should one puny, insignificant uh, human being be be shown something like that? That that was one of the things that was on my mind. Because Laura says, "Well, there's your dream. You know, there's there's God." They said the Indian said, "You're going to see God today," and and, there, and I I didn't say, "Oh yeah, sure, wow." You know, it was like. It was just, uh, even though I had been studying this uh, problem for decades, um, it, it was a, a very powerful experience. I just couldn't accept why. Why would God want to show up for? A, you mean the problem, little, uh, microbe, uh, which is myself. So it, it mean, didn't end. You mean the, you mean the problem of an individual being shown something this dramatic? Absolutely. Okay, you can't. And believe you know what that, is okay. interesting about that? That that was precisely the problem that was on my mind. 
the problem was on my mind was, yes, I do accept there is, if you want to call it a God, but I don't like the word God because it creates all kinds of wrong images in people's minds of a guy in the yeah. sky with a long beard oh, yeah, and all yeah, that. Yeah, I don't yeah, say yeah, that. Yeah. I don't, I don't, just like uh, Heinrich Zimmer said, uh, the best way to know God is to get beyond God because that's a, a human uh, response. So I, that was my thing. I thought, I thought like, okay, I believe in this, in this force, whatever you call it, divine or whatever. Yeah, it does exist. It's a consciousness. But I cannot believe it. it, it why would something uh, the, the size and shape and power of the entire universe be interested in, in a puny little single individual? But here it was happening. So, but I, I couldn't grok it. Even yeah. even after that, and my, my my answer to that is that I'd rather stay with um, Earth and the the tremendous complexity around us. And so I. I suggest something called the psychosphere, which is which is our mental atmosphere, and that's far enough for me to get away uh, to, to expand. The universe is much too large for me to consider, and that's well, where uh, you're, and that's, you're you're all right. Let me let me finish the synchronicity though, because it's not done. I, 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 I want to hear it, but we're coming to the yeah. we're coming to the end of this segment, and oh, okay. I, would, I, I want to make sure you have enough time to get to how okay. you interpret it, because that's all part of what we're talking about here is the, okay. the this menu creature making something out of this. You have been you are listening to Connecting with Coincidence with your host Bernie Beitman, MD, on the Exxon Broadcast Network, and our guest is Frank Joseph. Did you know that when you're on the road with limited data or Wi-Fi, you can still listen to the x Radio Show with Rob McConnell, The Science of Magic with Gwilda Wiaka, X-1, Dimension X, Space Patrol, and every minute of the x Broadcast Network by calling 213-401-0080, courtesy of Audio Now. No smartphone, app, or internet needed. It saves your data plan, and it's free if you have unlimited minutes. Call 213-401-0080 to listen on any phone, anytime, anywhere. Remember 213-401-0080 for the best of the paranormal, parapsychology, and sci-fi radio programming anywhere, 24-7-365. You have heard of the X-Zone? Now watch it on Simo TV plus 500 video games, live TV channels, free video on demand, worldwide, and more. Does this sound like tomorrow's television? Well, it is, but you can have it today, right now. It is Simul TV. Simul TV offers what the others only wish they could provide. 15 exclusive channels like X-Zone, Sci-Fi, and Horror. We are worldwide. No other provider offers that. 500 built-in video games. No need to have an extra expensive system. We have them included. Free video on demand. Live streaming events from around the world. Interactive online network and much more. Tomorrow's TV today. Simul TV. Sound too good to be true? Well, it's not. You can have Simul TV today. Sign up at simultv.com. Do it today. We live in rapidly shifting times of extreme volatility and uncertainty. Such profound change brings a unique opportunity for the evolution of consciousness. I'm Gwilda Wiecka, host of Mission Evolution Radio Show, a program that explores the latest scientific developments and deepening spiritual truths supporting human evolution. Join me on xzbn.net, where I interview leading experts in science, physics, medicine, spirituality, and more. By applying divergent viewpoints to leading-edge topics, we uncover expansive and evolutionary truth to assist you on your path to enlightenment. More information and past episodes are available at missionevolution.org. Yeah, 
Yes, welcome back to Connecting with Coincidence with Dr. Bernie Beitman, MD, that is me. And we are talking with Frank Joseph, author of the recent book, Synchronicity as a Mystical Experience. And you had what we could call a mystical experience with that cloud. It, it definitely was. And the denouement for it, the, uh, that sort of tied it together and it made it sense was, uh, after this experience, of course, my mind was consumed with this the whole time, I, and it was so consumed with it I couldn't even think straight. And uh, so I went alone uh, at the end of the day and the early evening to one of the most beautiful single spots I've ever seen on Earth. And uh, you climb uh, a mountain of uh, ridges behind Mary's Lake, also in Estes Park. That's a very common place. A lot of people have gone there. And um, you climb up there, and you have this fabulous lake, lake below you, and the vistas are beyond my powers to explain. They're so beautiful. So I climbed up there, and I've always gone to this kind of a bench they have up there, and I sat on this bench. I was trying to think about this, and I'm looking out over Mary's Lake, and I'm looking at Long's Peak. It's another favorite mountain. And as I'm looking at it, I realize it's another pyramid. <laughs> it's another... No, they're delta. It's, it's almost a perfect pyramidal shape. Uh, I'm running into that again, and then I feel something on the on, on the bench. And people, you know, they put carvings all over the thing, you know, and they carve their initials and so on. Well, and the, the park authorities have their hand their their job cut off from trying to smooth it out, make it look nice, you know. And so I'm sitting on this bench, and I feel there's one carving on there. And it looks, uh, feels strange. I look down on it, and my it's thumb is going over uh, a triangle. <laughs> exactly. And it was at that moment that the entire synchronicity came together in my own mind, and uh, with an uh, with an absolute conviction, uh, overwhelming of conviction. Of what? And the conviction is that there is this vast, impenetrable consciousness that organizes not just the world. The galaxies, absolutely everything. Everything is, is has been ordered and interpenetrated this, and it still has the ability to connect with each individual cellular atomic composition of everything. Because the mistake is that this consciousness, or the mistaken assumption, is that this consciousness is not something at all separate uh, from life that if you want to put this I, you have to fall back my weakness on the word God again but God the identity of God is the sum totality of everything that exists that is God the sum totality of everything that exists the real the you, real the real f interesting thing here the hard to grasp thing is that this entity that is everything can also somehow make itself known to each individual within its within itself. Correct. That is that's a, that is what I have come to believe. That is my. I, I don't. I agree with with Carl Jung. You know, somebody asked Jung, "Well, what do you believe in, Doctor Jung?" And he says, "I believe in hypotheses." <laughs> and I, I, I try to follow that, you know, he says, because trying to find the truth about anything scientific, you know, that was the great thing about him. He was a fabulous, fabulous scientist, a true scientist. He wasn't a, a wacko prophet. He was a true scientist who tried to, as you know, apply these things to the scientific method, and he made terrific progress in that. So I'm trying to follow him in, in that lead. I think it's a, it's a wise thing to follow his lead, not slavishly, of course, but follow his methodology. And so my hypothesis is exactly as you said, that there is, in fact, a living consciousness that interpenetrates, not only interpenetrates everything that is, from a falling leaf to a swirling galaxy and beyond both of those limitations, but it also is able to not just organize it, but to connect with it. That is very difficult, of course, to understand, but I believe that can be recognized. And here we are with our m m little consciousnesses being able to recognize that interpenetration to us. It's a, little, it's a little bit of a message telling us there's something greater of which we are it's a part. A, it's a terrific message, and what's the synchronicity of all these synchronicities together began with my internal 
doubts, uh, wondering like, okay, well, this godlike thing exists, but it can't. I can't pray to it. I can't talk to it. It's, it's just something. Why would it be interested in, in the slightest and a little puny thing like myself? And it is. <laughs> And and the, the, that's what the this Native American was telling me. So when I, I went on the internet afterwards, I figured like, what does this white feather mean? And it was pretty obvious what it means. The symbolism around it's uh, el- elder wisdom. I didn't know that until uh, I looked that up. So there's all these synchronicities. So in other words, the entire imagine this. Get this. The the vast consciousness of the entire universe, or multiverses, or however you want to put it, everything it is took time out, if you want to put it that way, to come to a, some little microbe myself wondering about these things and saying, yes, there is we, there is a, a personal relationship. I'd suggest that one of, is, I suggest one of the reasons that it did is you did something that this consciousness seems to uh, respond to. You were asking a that's question. Right. That's right. And that what this consciousness responded to was this consciousness – this is something that I have uh, come pre- pretty firmly to accept. It's a hypothesis, but it seems a strong one to me. And that is, well, what does this consciousness want? And what does it want with me? What does it want yeah. with, with us? Yeah. With hu- human beings, These vi- the little virus on this little dust fleck in the middle of the universe. <laughs> it wants us to, to, co- cooper- to co-create with it. I think that one of the words, one of the descriptions of, of God or this thing is called the creator. And that one I accept. I think that this is a creative impulse, and it is, it is inviting us as individuals to participate in its own creative process. I think that's what it wants us to do. I feel pretty strongly about that. I've documented thousands of synchronicities, mostly not my own. I shouldn't say thousands, maybe close to a thousand, many, many hundreds in any case. And the, the, the theme that runs through these synchronicities, the general theme is urging you on as an individual to do something, whatever it is. If you are a nuclear physicist or you're a good garbage collector, whatever it is that excites you, that you want to do, whether other people like it or not, whether you make any money or not, whatever you want to do, make model airplanes, if you do that, if you follow your bliss, like Joseph Campbell said, that's what God wants you to do. What about the God idea? Should... What about the Go idea ahead. that our consciousness is created so that God can be acknowledged? I don't think God is that much of an egotist. He doesn't care about that. I think God wants to. God is a child. God is is a, uh, a, a, a like a kid, and it wants to play with creativity. It wants us to play along. Very good. Very good. Now, another question related to this, um, you, you, that your book is rather thick. What do you think of the, of the fact that I, of all the stories you had in there, that I picked this one out to discuss? Well, it's because, as soon as you asked that one, I thought, hmm, uh, Dr. Beitman is very insightful. He went right to, uh, I think that's your intelligence. I don't think that's the synchronicity so much. I think that you either consciously or subconsciously, uh, you're very sharp on these things. That would have been the one to talk about. I didn't want to. I didn't really want to talk about that one because, quite frankly, I'm a little embarrassed about it. Uh, it sounds. It can, it can sound terrifically, monumentally I, uh, egotistical. Like, oh, here's God telling this guy all about it. But this is an experience that everybody has access to. Absolutely everyone. Yeah. All you have and, to do is think about the right questions. And yes. It'll come and, to you. Yes. And one of the one of the problems I had with your book was that there were a lot of coincidences that you described that I would not call of a mystical type. There are a variety of different kinds in there. But this mm-hmm. one was and your book is is titled Synchronicity as a Mystical Experience. And mm-hmm. that that story is a great example of it. And I picked it out kind of intuitively and I picked it out for maybe a little different reason, because uh, I can interpret more in Western science the what a delta, and you called it a delta in your book, not a triangle. Mm-hmm. Uh, use the right. word delta, and I, I love the delta. I, I, I because it has so many different meanings. The 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 particular shape it it means change. That's the fundamental one. And mm-hmm. when you do uh, chemical equations uh, and going from left side to the right side, you put a delta underneath. That means you have to put some heat into it. So it's ah, heat. 
I didn't it's, know that. Very good. Very it's, good. It's heat. And also, it's, it's often a, used as a symbol for the female, as in a sorority yeah. is called Delta, Delta, Delta. So, yeah. so, I, so I thought of those meanings from my perspective. Fitting in with that perfectly is the Egyptians' uh, concept of the pyramid. Of course, that's a Greek word, and the Greek uh-huh. word pyramid means the fire within. Uh. <laughs> pyre, you know, P-I and mid. Oh, pyre, that's good. Greek. Pyre, mid, that yeah. means in ancient and classical Greek, the fire within. Well, I, I was curious about your reaction to my having picked that one out. And and where that comes from um, is another interesting question, because in our next segment, uh, I want to talk with you uh, about the B-2 bomber story that you told in your book and remind you of a story that uh, that connected up with with a, a previous guest, Eben Alexander, who had... Uh, an experience much like that one, like the bomber experience you had. Uh, and I read your story in your book uh, a few hours before I interviewed Eben. And when that's when Eben told me his story. So oh. that... <laughs> synchronicities are pretty catchy. <laughs> <laughs> this one was pretty catchy. So uh, review it a little bit when we get to the next segment, uh, which we are just about to get to. You're listening to Connecting with Coincidence with your host, Bernie Beitman, AMD on the Exxon Broadcast Network. And our guest is Frank Joseph, author of Synchronicity as a Mystery experience. From our broadcast studios in Hamilton, Ontario, Canada, to the world and beyond, you're watching the Exxon Broadcast Network, www xzbn.net ABS Media You have heard of the X Zone? Now watch it on Simul TV, plus 500 video games, live TV channels, free video on demand, worldwide and more. Does this sound like tomorrow's television? Well it is, but you can have it today right now. It is Simul TV. Simul TV offers what the others only wish they could provide. 15 exclusive channels like X-Zone, Sci-Fi, and Horror. We are worldwide. No other provider offers that. 500 built-in video games. No need to have an extra expensive system. We have them included. Free video on demand. Live streaming events from around the world. Interactive online network and much more. Tomorrow's TV today. Simul TV. Sound too good to be true? Well, it's not. You can have Simul TV today. Sign up at simultv.com. Do it today. Did you know that when you're on the road with limited data or Wi Fi, you can still listen to the X Zone radio show with Rob McConnell, The Science of Magic with Gwilda Wiaka, X Minus One? Dimension X, Space Patrol, and every minute of the Exxon Broadcast Network by calling 213-401-0080, courtesy of Audio Now. No smartphone, app, or internet needed. It saves your data plan, and it's free if you have unlimited minutes. Call 213-401-0080 to listen on any phone, anytime, anywhere. Remember, 213-401-0080 for the best of the paranormal, parapsychology, and sci-fi radio programming anywhere, 24-7-365. Rob McConnell here, presenting an overview for Nicholas Paul Jinnix, author of a fascinating book, Amen. It presents facts revealed by Egyptologists, facts that enable us to understand why Amen is the beginning of creation of God. It provides recommendations for religious leaders of the major religions to unify their beliefs and teach the word of God, love one another. Amen informs people how mankind conceived God. 
It was the Egyptians that developed the concepts of a soul, a hereafter, and son of God. And finally, after the worship of many gods, they conceived the belief in one universal God, the maker of all there is. For more information, visit www.futureofgodamen.com. That's www.futureofgodamen.com. Yes, welcome back to CC with BB, Connecting with Coincidence. I am your host, Dr. Bernie Weidman, MD, and we've been talking with Frank Joseph about some pretty cool coincidences. And there was one that I reviewed a little bit in, uh, at the end of the last segment, go through it a little bit, a little bit more. Um, the day before I was going to interview Eben Alexander uh, about his new book, I read a coincidence in Frank's book about the – synchronicity and mystical experiences he had been writing about these bombers uh, these b-17 b-24 bombers from world war ii when he felt the need for sunshine and a breath of fresh air he heard a strange deep droning coming up from the sky coming up in the sky and first a b-17 and then a b-24 bomber passed over him then how did that happen so frank had to wonder about that and he does in his book and that was the spring of 2001 Four hours later, I was talking to Eben on the uh, radio show, and he just he said while living near Boston, uh, he was create, clearing out his attic. He suddenly remembered he had a radio-controlled model B-2 bomber but had not seen it in two years. He felt the, the need to look for it, and after not finding it in the attic, he ran down to the garage and didn't see it. And then he went out to the driveway and, like Frank, looked up and saw a real B-2 bomber flying right over the house at fairly low altitude. This is the only time he'd seen one, and yes, again, it was the spring of 2001. Frank, what do you think of that, the, yours and, and this kind of conflagration of two of them so similar? Well, those are very easy to understand. Um, the mechanism, uh, if, I've, if I've discovered anything in this, and maybe I haven't discovered it, maybe others have found it, but I haven't found anybody else that's uh, stumbled across this. There seems to be a common denominator to these synchronicities, and I call it a mechanism, and that is passion. If you are passionately engaged in something, the synchronicities constellate around you, and they enumerate the... Um, structure of this question that's on your mind or this passion that's involving you. A person that is passionless, that is not engaged, has far fewer synchronicities or those kinds of synchronicities that sort of urge them on to get passionate. I think, I think, I think, that, th I think that idea of yours that synchronicities are there to urge us on is very, very important. I think that's a nice way of pulling things together. Uh, then I have I have done some research, just uh, quantitative research, which also shows that high emotion in a couple of different ways is correlated with increased coincidence sensitivity. So there's a lot to support what you're talking about. Uh, in this in in this coincidence, I've never had a coincidence quite like this one, where. Uh, I'm reading one thing and then talk to somebody who tells me a similar story uh, uh, shortly thereafter. And so I'm in the middle of this, but each of you is having one. You're passionate about the uh, the B-17 and B-24 bombers, but that doesn't happen all the time. And, and Evan was looking for his B-2 bomber uh, model, and there it was. And then I was trying to get ready for a radio show. So there was em there's emotion in all three of us in this. It still doesn't explain it enough. It sets the stage for it. Well, I, can, I can explain, elucidate a little bit more on that. Uh, please, you, are, please or, do. you definitely were, were part of this shared synchronicity that we had. You uh, are involved in something, another salient feature of synchronicity is the connecting principle where things that are totally unrelated, there's no chance that these things could be related, all of a sudden form an extremely meaningful relationship and under a power that has nothing to do with the individual parts, you, me, or this other fellow. The fact that there's this passionate connectivity going on 
creates a kind of an electrical bridge. This again, this is an analogy. It doesn't mean it's actual electricity, of course. But there's no less there's a, a dynamic bridge that is suddenly created. You are passionately involved not in the in the aircraft. You're passionately involved in this wonderful uh, question of synchronicity. He's, here are two good examples. Bang! You become the uh, uh, the focal point that brings them together. Brings all three together. So I think that that's what that is. This is this connecting principle. As far as what does this mean? Uh, again, it's God as the clown. You know, many people, uh, peoples like the Hopi Indians, for example, they regard God as a clown. And when the early Christians were confronted by this, they thought this was like supreme blasphemy or calling Jesus a clown. Well, yes, of course. Uh, it's not disrespectful. It's the exact opposite. Because sometimes people are so hung up in themselves that they need to, be, to laugh at themselves. They need a kind of a whimsical uh, moment that breaks them away from their usual uh, per, per serious, per, over-serious perception of things. That's why in the Hopi uh, dances, there's a, a Hopi dance, the clown dance, and all these dancers are representations of God. And that's because God has to do things like as a rattle and so forth to wake you up, to make you pay attention. And I think that that's kind of funny. Like here's this guy looking for a model, and <laughs> he's just looking for, he'd be perfectly happy with a model, and here the real thing appears. I mean, isn't that great? But it's funny. I think that's kind of funny. I've gotten I some criticism on my books uh, about synchronicity. So you're saying, oh, you uh, you failed because you've never uh, shown the evil synchronicities, the bad synchronicities. I've never found any. <laughs> I find, every synchronicity I've found. I can't think of a single one. Uh, some of them are rather grim. They talk about, but those are because of things we do to ourselves mostly. But I've never found one that was really led anybody astray or did anything that was harmful. But most of them have a whimsical character to them. The one with the with the delta in the sky that was not whimsical. That was very serious. But I was that was a very serious question I had. The question I had was, can I talk to God? Probably not. And now the synchronicity comes and says, well, of course you can. <laughs> Mark, Mark David Chapman used synchronicities as uh, a way to urge himself to uh, assassinate John Lennon. Well, that, those are not the synchronicities. That's uh, obviously the flawed human being. That um, Anything can be abused or used, but the, the synchronicities are he, – he willfully interpreted them. Yes. Uh, or I mean, used them as an excuse – Use them as an excuse to uh, commit evil. Well, I could I could just use your your phrasing to saying that they urge you on to do something that you've been wanting to do that you need to do, and he felt the need to do this. And he the end of the end of it was uh, was Mia Farrow walking into the the same building that she was an actress in for Rosemary's Baby, where the bit where that Rosemary Baby was filmed in the same building that John Lennon. Uh, was living in, and that Mia Farrow is now walking into that building alive, of the live Mia, Mia Farrow, and there were uh -huh. several others in, involving uh, some of the so, some Beatles songs and other connections um, mm -hmm. that that he used. It was a whole string of things that you could say was a pretty amazing set of coincidences, and it urged uh -huh. him on much in the same way that you were talking about before. That uh, that they may, they get us to do things that uh, we need to do or feel like we want to do, no matter what people think. But the difference is we are in charge. They are not ordering us around. We're not hearing voices in our heads saying, you will go out and shoot this person and all that. That's not the, those are not synchronicities. Those are mental aberrations. And if you're being approached by something like an important synchronicity that's urging you on, you are in control to interpret it. The, I, I tell everybody in the classes that I have in the lectures that you, the individual, are the ultimate authority on these synchronicities that are happening. Not me, because I've written a couple of books about it. It doesn't give me any right to tell anybody about their synchronicities. I can lay out certain themes. I can help them to appreciate these synchronicities. Yes, they really exist, so forth. But each synchronicity is a personal letter, a personal missive that you are receiving from God. You can put it that way if you want, and that you can't run to somebody and say, can you read this for me? No, this is your letter. This is your communication. And if somebody is in a 
mentally confused state that they're going to take something like that out of there, and that's their tragedy and other tragedies. But it's, it's not the, the synchronicity. If he had looked upon this in a, in a clearer light, these synchronicities might have been telling him something and probably were telling him something completely different. Um. Oh, I can't tell you his mind. I can tell you only what no. was re reported, and right. and it's well. Well, we'll. I think we'll we'll differ on this. Um, yeah. That, that I think he was using synchronicity and what he saw as synchronicity in just the way you're talking about, as this was a letter to him to do what he felt he needed to do. Not that it was evil. It was awful. It was terrible. But it was I still. Suspect I suspect with this that he wanted to do this from the beginning and that when these synchronicities came along, he used them as justification to uh, do what he wanted to do. I, I think that's, that's I think that's I think that's correct. Yeah. And I, I think I, I've done I've done stuff like that, too, where I've taken um, something I wanted to do uh, and used coincidences to be able to do it. And I think that's consistent with some of what you were saying before. The intent is the important thing. I mean, yes, it's perfectly intent. fine for you to do that. If you, let's say you have a good intent, like I want to make this painting, but eh, maybe I shouldn't, too much time, too much money, blah, blah, blah. And then you have these synchronicities that are urging you on to do that. Well, that, that obviously is a very positive thing. People have to decide these things individually, as I said. And um, I think that's what, what he had in mind. He, yeah, I, it is what he had in mind. It's, it's, yeah. I think we have to develop an ethics of, yes. of, co of coincidence or synchronicity interpretation. And they and it have to do with not just that it's the individual who decides. It's that there are at least some good and bad things that we can think about uh, that, oh, yeah. that will help us decide whether to do something or not. Uh, mm -hmm. I, I I know stories of people were coming to the end of the segment who were made bad decisions based on coincidences uh, that turned out in the long run to be okay. You're listening to Connecting with Coincidence with your host, Bernie Beitman, MD, on the Exxon Broadcast Network. Our guest is Frank Joseph. You have heard of the X Zone? Now watch it on Simo TV, plus 500 video games, live TV channels, free video on demand, worldwide, and more. Does this sound like tomorrow's television? Well, it is, but you can have it today, right now. It is Simo TV. Simo TV offers what the others only wish they could provide 15 exclusive channels like X Zone, Sci Fi, and Horror. We are worldwide. No other provider offers that. 500 built-in video games. No need to have an extra expensive system. We have them included. Free video on demand. Live streaming events from around the world. Interactive online network and much more. Tomorrow's TV today. Simul TV. Sound too good to be true? Well, it's not. You can have Simul TV today. Sign up at SimulTV.com. Do it today. The new nonfiction book, Razor of Madness, is similar to cult movies like Clockwork Orange, Dragon's Tattoo, or The Other Side of Hell. Wayne Morin Jr. and Thomas Lee Howe will expose widespread and systematic deficiencies in this thought-provoking tell-all novel. Mind control rages among scholars in law schools. Human rights are ignored while thought reform and mental manipulation are accepted practices used as behavior modification. Dr. Louis Jolion West comes to mind. Media and public scrutiny shows that United States mental hospitals are in fact destructive murder industries. Razor of Madness Expose Novel details this epidemic through an in-depth professional and personal investigation. For decades there has been a revolving door policy that still releases killers and pedophiles back into society. The maestro of mind control continues to haunt America to this very day. Razor of Madness is available in paperback or as a downloadable ebook at Amazon.com. The concept of a new age has been around since the late 19th century, yet much of its original meaning has been lost. What exactly is the new age? 
Is it a religion? A collection of obscure esoteric practices? A series of doomsday predictions? Or an astrological event? The New Age Chronicles is a unique, complimentary publication bringing reason and grounded information to separate fact from fiction. Chock full of valuable information to support you as we make the monumental shift into the new era. You won't want to miss a single innovative issue. The New Age Chronicles newspaper is coming soon to www.newagechronicles.com. Welcome back to CC with BB, and we are talking with Frank Joseph, who has a wide-ranging knowledge uh, and deep understanding of synchronicity. And it's a pleasure talking with talking with you, Frank, about this subject that I think is so important to, for us to get out there into the world. Uh, I think you, we're kindred spirits. <laughs> I think so. And I, I, before we get into Carl Jung, uh, I, I want to know what you think about how we can get uh, th- these messages about synchronicity out there better. Well, I think that you're doing a wonderful job. This is a great show, and I think we're having a very excellent conversation about it. Anybody listening in that's got to take some kind of interest in it, and of course there's our books and so on. That's about all we can do, just do the best we can. We're that, even... That's all I can yeah, go ahead. That's yeah, all we can ahead. do. Uh, well, there there are other ways of doing it, like organizing um, uh, something, like uh, uh, a group somehow that helps f- put together ideas about not only how to say what we need to say, but also how to get it out there to other people. But I'll just ask you to think about it a little bit. I have the radio yeah. show, I have a website, I have a Psychology Today blog, and uh, several other oh. things. But this, 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 um, I appreciate the fact that you're getting these ideas out there as well. And let's let's go in this final segment about about your relationship with Carl Jung. Of course, you never met him, but you, from what you're telling me, you've read a lot and thought a lot about Jung and uh, and maybe some Jungian. So you you're also clear to say that you can't take everything Jung says at face value because he was limited by his time. And the information that was around, and also his own, his own limitations too. But he really got out there into the synchronicity world and helped us, you and I, be able to be talking about it. So tell us, t- tell us about your relationship with uh, Carl Jung. My relationship with Carl Jung is that, uh, to my mind, he is one of the the great heroes of science. One of the great heroes of all science, going back to the ancient Greeks. And the reason why I say that is not because he was a brilliant man and did original research. The reason I say that is because he had already already risen high in the profession as a very close colleague of uh, Sigmund Freud. And he came to an impasse with Freud, finally understood that Freud was totally wrong, that worse than wrong, that Freud was misleading millions of people and was the exact anti-science. And I, I disagree. I disagree with that. I, I I grew up with Freudian thinking, and there mm-hmm. was a lot. There were a lot of good ideas that Freud had that oh, I apply, yeah. that I apply, uh, that have been even research tested. So this broad condemnation of Freud doesn't fit with my experience. Well, it, 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 actually, it does, uh, because Freud talked a really good game. Obviously, it wouldn't have been as popular as it hadn't been was sort of a thing people were hankering for. This is this can go into a, a long conversation, not an argument at all, because I, I, I follow your, your line of reasoning. But to get back to what I'm saying about Freud, is that Jung had reached a point in his life where he was a very um, popular and uh, successful scientist. He made this break with Freud, and during the break, he became persona non grata. His career went down the tubes. Uh, he... He really had nowhere else to go except back up. And um, only after decades was he able to reassert himself. He's now emerged as the the true uh, thinker of his kind from the 20th century, uh, whereas Freud has slipped further and further in the background. And I feel very confident that Freud will be hardly more than a footnote, an anecdote 
to the degenerative powers of the 20th century. Now that's, whereas, a, that, that's, 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 that's so uh, my, not my experience and what I know. Uh, <laughs> okay, Fro well, that's what makes it interesting. Fr Freud, Freud brought to all of us ideas that are now part of the uh, regular consciousness in the Western world and now probably mm -hmm. more in the Eastern world. The, the simple idea that um, parental influences uh, help create the kind of problems and potentials for each one of us uh, and that that was ignored um, that was not understood not that it was around wasn't around for a while but that the child is the father of the man is has been is something that he helped create and people are thinking that they know about this the subconscious and the unconscious they know about defense mechanisms and these are all describable by research not just uh, anecdote uh, events in people's lives Lives. Freud was limited. He had a personal unconscious where Jung added the collective unconscious. And I think both of them need to be respected. Well, I say it's a very interesting argument. As far as uh, Freud originating this material, not at all. There was a man by the name of Arthur Schopenhauer, a very popular science, the, the philosopher of pessimism, all these ideas had been explicated long before, in the century before, or many decades before Jung even got going. And, and, Jung, Jung, and, Jung, pay, and Jung pays a lot of respect to Chinese philosophers as well. Yes, as a lot yes, of, absolutely. Yeah. We, we all so, stand on that, the show. We stand on the shoulders. Here. We stand on the shoulders of giants. So I'm going to ask yeah. you for the rest of this: is please don't do your blanket condemnations of Freud, because I'll get I'll respond <laughs> yeah, to I, that. I don't I, I don't have very much respect for Freud. I and, got that. Uh, I got yeah. that. And I don't want to argue with you about it because no. I lost respect for Freud and psychoanalysts for the same way I'm losing respect for some Jungians because they get too much caught up in the great man as prophet and not do yeah. their own thinking. Yeah. And yeah. Jungians yeah. are doing the same thing. So uh, I, I, I just let's stay away from Freud because uh, <laughs> okay. that's not really what I'm asking you about. OK, well, I guess the reason why I really admire uh, the number one reason why I do admire Jung has nothing to do with Freud, and that is uh, his recognition of synchronicity. It was a very brave thing to do in 1950 or 1951. It was. Without his book, it's called On Synchronicity. Uh, his own followers were appalled that he would be speaking about this. He was criticized for too much spirituality and everything. And again, he put his career on the line a second time, uh, and then towards the end of his life as well. But he stuck to it, stuck to his guns. Uh, so the man emerges in my mind as as a hero uh, for the reason that he um, did not back down on his ideas at a time when he could have suffered for them, and in fact, did well, he, for he them. knew they were right because of his experiences that created the Red Book, among other things. That that back in the nineteen teens, when he was going upstairs and getting into the cosmic consciousness, he knew these things. He had direct experience, so he had to be able to talk about it. And it was great to do that. I mean, he could have chosen to keep it all to himself, or if he wanted to yes. write it up and yes. after he's yeah. dead, they can read about it. But no, right. he championed it personally, and uh, therefore he's a, he's a hero. He's a true scientific hero, and there are people like that are very few and far between because you got to stand up against the vast majority. He was all alone. He in, in those days when he came up with synchronicity, he was a man apart, and he he was a, he's a giant. Oh, yes, and we only have about three minutes left, so uh, let's talk about his giantism and you and you. Well, he's a giant, and I'm a dwarf. <laughs> no, I, he's influenced you a lot. That's what I mean. Oh yes, yeah. Well, yes. There's been a lot of what really influenced me about him more than any specific thing, and there are many things, many uh, anecdotal materials that are very valuable. Uh, it's like he keeps me on track. He still keeps me on track. Because he, he says, you know, you have to continue to apply these scientific principles. And he said, you have to consider yourself. Everybody is a scientist, he says. Just because you have a degree or you don't have a degree is meaningless. A yes, true scientist yes. is just anyone that looks into these questions honestly. Uh, and yes. you have, to, you have yes. to consider everything on the table so that when nonsense comes to you, you look it over and say, I can't use this now. Uh, it doesn't fit. I'm not going to throw it away. I'm going to put it on this part of the table and keep it over there. You throw nothing away, he says. The true scientist has discernment. You have to find those elements that work for you. 
And when they work for you, you can build a hypothesis. This doesn't mean that the things that you did not use are worthless. They just don't fit this particular view. So that got him in a lot of trouble, too, <laughs> because he had a lot of nonsense on his table. He said, it's fine. I do have a lot of nonsense. I'm like a carpenter, he said. And he was a carpenter. He was a great carpenter as well. He says, a carpenter, he says, you, you don't, because you made a mistake with this one particular thing or it doesn't work, doesn't mean you throw it away. You keep everything until the job is done. <laughs> when the job is finished, then you can throw stuff away. So I think that he is was, a sign. He was so clever well, with words. So clever with words. Uh, there's another famous carpenter back about 2,000 years ago. That's kind of an interesting way to look at it. <laughs> yeah. yeah, the chef, you know. He said something that is not valuable to you now, you might realize is very valuable. It does fit in later on. <laughs> and, of course, uh, they, didn't, they didn't like those uh, kind of his own parables, his own Swiss parables. <laughs> Well, that's okay, great no, that we disagree about these things, and it is important that, that I think that uh, men do disagree on po important points, because that's when you explore them. And then now I'm going to go back and think like, well, maybe he did raise a good point. Maybe there's something here or there, you know, and it's important to have arguments. It's important to have offend people today. Oh, don't offend people. I think that's a big mistake. We need to offend people. We have to be as offensive as possible. Because when you that, are offensive, you make people think about these things, regardless of whether they like, like you or not. Who cares? That, that's, that's good. I didn't think of the relationship, the double meaning, the two meanings of offensive. Offensive is, is as you say, but it also means, means proactive. It means be, yes. being active, offensive. You know, for instance, some kind of homogenized soup of agreement – there's zero progress there. Oh, you're wonderful. I'm wonderful. Yeah, we're all right. You know, that's that's the end. That's death. That's stagnation. And it's we're only getting, when you have you have to struggle for have ideas. That, you have to yeah. struggle with ideas and struggle to with struggle for ideas with someone who is struggling with you, so that you have yes. some agreement that you can disagree and and have fun with it, as we just did. Uh, I think is really a pleasure, and we've come to the end of uh, of our show, Frank. And it's been a great pleasure having you on here and having a nice argument with you and learning stuff from you. So, <laughs> thank you for being on the show. Well, it's been a great pleasure, and I hope we can do it again sometime. Great. You're listening to Connecting with Coincidence on the X Zone Broadcast Network. This is Bernie Beitman, MD, signing off. Modern Esoteric, Beyond Our Senses by Brad Olson, consummates the lifeology story about where humanity originates. It is the lost continents, the primitive wisdom, the mythos of creation, and the rethinking of ancient history as we are taught in academia. There is much more to the story than what we have been told. As this is the first book in the Esoteric series, Modern Esoteric starts at the beginning of time and accelerates up to this modern age. Future Esoteric is book two in the series and takes a forward-looking position ahead of today with an open and honest examination of the ET issue and various unexplained phenomena. To discover the writings of author Brad Olson, visit www.bradolson.com. That's www.bradolson.com. Are you or is someone you know struggling with addictions, depression, anxiety, relationships, low self-esteem, lack of confidence, grief, success, and prosperity? Do you know that your subconscious belief plays a big role in the outcome of your hard work? We can help you permanently change the beliefs that may be the reason for your struggles and failures. We care about getting you the return on your investment and the results you are looking for. We can help you be free of the limitations of your past and in realizing your highest potential. We work with people by phone and Skype. For more information, visit us at www.ritasoman.com. That's www.ritasoman.com. Do you think you have energy problems in your home? Do you feel better when you're away than when you're home? 
Joey Korn is a global leader in the world of dowsing who specializes in personal energy clearing and space clearing. He can help you create an ideal energy environment in your home no matter where you live in the world. Learn about his remote spiritual house cleaning services and much more at www.dowsers.com. You can get Joey's book, Dowsing, A Path to Enlightenment, as well as other dowsing books and tools, Kabbalah books, and Walter Russell books. Joey's work is really amazing. Go to dowsers.com right now. That's D-O-W-S-E-R-S dot com or call 1-877-DOWSING. That's 1-877-369-7464.